We did see that non-invasive mechanical ventilation, it can be given in the form of two parts. One is a continuous positive airway pressure, where I did tell you that it's a positive pressure which is maintained throughout, throughout the respiratory cycle of inspiration as well as expiration. And the second is the non-IPPV or the bi-level, where we have two levels of pressure, uh, which we definitely uh, can be uh, applied at one during inspiration and one at the time of expiration. We also saw how non-invasive ventilation, the delivery is done. This delivery is done with the help of mask or the interface. And the different masks are there in the form of a nasal mask or an oronasal mask or the helmet. As well as these ventilators are again easy. They are quite low cost. They have got certain monitoring techniques. The oxygen printers are there. But we also have got critical care ventilators, which are now can able to deliver non-invasive mechanical ventilation. The accessories we did uh, see in the last talk also here that we have got the humidification, we have got the heat humidifier which is filtered over the heat and moisture exchange filters. Then we have also got which also helps to reduce the nasal resistance because of the humidification. It improves the compliance and more importantly, the oxygen can also be given via the inspiratory circuit and critical care ventilators with vendors. They provide adequate amount of FiO2 and nebulization can also be carried out with most of the continuous flow circuits without changing uh, the pressures which are going to be delivered to the patients. Now the basic principle of non-invasive ventilation we did see, it's a spontaneous mode. So this is a negative triggering where the patient triggers the breath and the inspiration starts occurring. Here is the IPAP or the inspiratory pressure or what I thought of the inspiratory pressure or the IPAP what we achieved. Then we reach a plateau level that is the maximum pressure that what we have set we achieve and then automatically we go from the inspiration to the expiration cycle and the expiration you know is a passive process till you deliver to the epap level or the or that is the peep level what we have set so this is the basic principle it helps you to offload the respiratory muscles it helps you to give, reduce the fatigue of the respiratory muscles and therefore that uh, it reduces the respiratory rate as well as the work of breathing. When delivering mechanical ventilation, there are two types of ventilatory pumps which are active. One is the mechanical ventilator or the machine which is there. And second, it is the patient's own respiratory pump or here the respiratory mechanics play an important role. Okay, how, what is the strength of the respiratory muscle? How the diaphragms are working? How is uh, the spine, whether there is kyphosis, kyphoscoliosis, that is also going to play a very major role. And these two pumps must work together for a synchronized and a harmonious delivery uh, so that the fatigue and the respiratory function is performed well. So the main function of NIPPV or non-invasive is to reduce the respiratory muscle workload and avoid the respiratory muscle fatigue. What we have seen, there is also the alveolar ventilation is also increased and it counterbalances the intrinsic heat and decreases the workload. And more importantly, it also improves the respiratory system compliance by recruiting the collapsed alveoli. And this is mainly done with the help of the EPAP, which is equivalent to the feet because it opens up the alveoli, keeps the alveoli open, and also helps to decrease the afterload. And as a result of which, this is mainly used into cardiogenic pulmonary demands and cardiac failures. We did see how the initiation occurs. You have to start off with low pressure, start off with an IPAP level of about six to eight centimeters and gradually go on increasing depending upon uh, to asking the patient what is the best level and uh, of what he is comfortable. See the respiratory rate, see the saturation and the peak is if it started off with four centimeters to five centimeters and depending upon the requirements of the peak, whether FIO2 needs to go up, depending upon the oxygen saturation, we need to increase the peak level. The inspiratory trigger is usually set at 0 0.5 to 1 liters and the trigger of the cycling of, of is between about 40 to 70 percent of the maximum inspiratory flow and the pressure time is usually set at 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 and that is usually either also the rise time or also the ramp time what i uh, did discuss it with you last time so this is in short about the challenges it minimizes the air leaks there could be patient ventility asynchrony there is a late recognition of predictors of non-invasive failure there is a following a protocol which needs to be followed and what we discussed it even last time how it should be initiated it's like a procedure you need to explain to the patient and then start off gradually by initiation of non-invasive ventilation now the asynchrony which occurs 
Asynchrony that means there is no proper synchronization. The synchronization can asynchrony occurs at two levels. One is during the inspiratory trigger, and because of the inspiratory trigger, why it will occur? One is auto theory. Second is double triggering, and third is ineffective inspiratory effort. If the patient is not taking adequate amount of effort, or the second kind of uh, asynchrony will occur when the patient is cycling from inspiration to expiration because expiration is again a passive process where it may occur because of a delayed cycling or a premature kind of cycling which will occur so this is a normal as i told you there is a trigger which goes off and then you reach a peak you reach a plateau pressure and then the pressure uh, is then released to a zero level or to the uh, to the level at what the epap has been set and secondly again this is the maximum pressure of the inspiratory pressure what we have said this is the peak or this is the end expiratory pressure to what Uh, we have to get this set here, and then the cycling is going to occur from inspiration uh, to expiration without any leaks, and therefore there is not going to be any leaks. Now, if you hear here the cycling occurs here, then sometimes you can see there is a large amount of leaks which is occurring, or air trapping which is also can, can also occur, and that is not a good sign. So, the adequate amount of pressure or certain amount of disincrony uh, which is going to occur. Now, this ideally should occur here, but in case if you find here. that sometimes there is a early uh, kind of triggering or late kind of triggering then definitely the pressures are not and they're going to be early and this is going to be hazardous and the patient is going to be still breathless now how to manage it to have to minimize the air leak and more importantly you have to reduce the pressure support when the tidal volumes are large and the breathing efforts fail to trigger it sedate the patient if required don't sedate the patient on non invasive too much you have to have a good sedation titration so that the patient easily wakes up and follows commands and use the various dual modes which are new modes which are available this is beyond the scope of this talk and that is the awaps which will be discussing later if required so and use pav that is proportional assist uh, ventilation this is again the newer modes uh, which i'm sure uh, will be covered up in the future uh, talks which will occur now various papers which are also there that the patient ventilation or synchrony during non ventilation non invasive ventilation in simulated copd this paper was again okay, came back way back in 2016 and, uh, and this was given uh, by deeper and he said that low cyclical criteria basically low cycling is the mainly responsible for uh, the severe expiratory latency and augmenting of uh, the uh, the reduced expiratory cycling with decrease intrinsic amount of heat and avoided non supported breath and setting the cycling to 50% of the inspiratory flow is achieved for best synchronization so that's what we said we have to set the cycling to about 50% of the peak inspiratory flow that is more important and overall they also suggested to use the helmet interface it also increase the inspiratory cycle and that was also suggested during this now more importantly how nrv is beneficial yes as i told you india is one of the largest users of non invasive ventilation in the world but at the same time because of improper indication or not selection of the proper patient nrv failure can occur the nrv failure can occur as intermittent which can be within minutes or two or minutes to it early between the first one hour to 48 hours and late is after 48 hours and we will definitely see the reasons why you will get these kind of failures and these failures basically will occur is if the intermediate is within minutes is because of a weak cuff reflex or because of large amount of secretion the patient continues to aspirate the patient is in coma the patient is in encephalopathy as i did told you that the patient selection is very improper and the patient has to be uh, has not should not be agitated and he should be cooperative Secondly, early failure can occur like in case if you have not monitored the patients well, and you still find acidosis to be remain persistent at the end of one hour or at the end of 48 hours, and you still find that the pH is bad. There is a severity of the disease. You find that the patient's respiratory rate is still going up, and the, the uh, PACI score uh, is quite high. And uh, if the patient's GCS is poor, that means the patient is not uh, quite uh, level of consciousness is not better. and late failure can occur because of functional limitations and also because of initial improvement in the ph or also because of acidosis and severe kind of hyperglycemia which will occur now more importantly the operator dependent factors they indicated in failure of non invasive positive pressure mechanical ventilation this was again there 
So the failures mainly implicated was one improper indication was one of the most important feature uh, for the, the failure which was there. Sorry, and the progression of the underlying disease. If there is a progression of pneumonia, if the progression of pulmonary edema, an inadequate amount of titration if you are not able to titrate the machine well, and if you have not seen the patient or contraindications have not been overloaded and then it's been used, then definitely there is going to be a failure. And this was published in 2015 in the in the Journal of Respiratory Care. The mortality also depends upon the various categories. And if you basically see that if you are using the appropriate indication, definitely the mortality is going to be about 50% to about 70%. But if you are using non-invasive, just because it is quite easy, that in a non-indicated situation, the mortality is going to go almost about 25 to 30 percent, and that is not a good thing. And therefore, you know that NIV it can be used at various levels in the hospital. We have seen even in transport, it can be used in the emergency departments. We can use it from the emergency to the wards, the ICU, the step-down units, long-term home care. Everywhere, non-invasive mechanical ventilation can be used, and we have got small machines which can also be used in the home. So, important thing is, yes, where it should be used. One, non-invasive ventilation in acute respiratory failure or in chronic respiratory failure. And in acute respiratory failure, we have got hypoxemic respiratory failure or hypercapnic respiratory failure. And these were amongst the indications what we did see.